Okay, everyone. So I think it's about time to get started. It's uh, seven o'clock here Central Time and eight o'clock uh, Eastern Standard Time. So thanks everyone for joining. It uh, looks like we already have 18 people who are on the Zoom stream here. Um, so uh, let's get started. So these are some more high yield pulmonary pathology cases that with me and that is Matt Cicchini. Um, So the first thing here um, is, uh, so I'm gonna be using poll everywhere um, during this. And so um, you'll see the link here at the top, pollef.com slash Matt 722. So if everyone could go here and we can kind of start off with kind of a fun activity of clicking where you're joining from. We've already had a few people um, uh, indicate where they're joining from initially. So um, I'd ideally like you to keep this open during the session because I'm going to ask some questions and some polls during it. Um, and in the Zoom group chat, um, there's also a Zoom group chat as well. So if you have questions or you want to point something out or um, I'm asking some other questions during it, feel free to type something in there. So I don't know if someone wants to type something in there just so we can make sure it's working. Um, As people are putting, oh yeah, perfect. So I saw something from Matthew Lau there. Perfect, hi Phoenix. So everyone, okay. So hey Susan, so let's get this uh, started. So perfect, thanks everyone. So let's move on to our first case here. So as it's loading up, so we can see here that the we have a lesion here within the lung. So the first question I have here, and so I was hoping someone could put in the chat is, is where is this lesion arising? What would you describe the location? So we have this kind of space here, and then we have this cartilage here, and then we have these minor salivary glands here, and then there's this mass or this tumor present. How would you describe where the tumor is present? Um, as a bit of a hint. Yeah, so it's bronchus, yeah, and it's actually an endobronchial lesion. So it's growing and pushing out into the airway. So how do you think this patient might have presented if they have this big tumor sitting in their airway? How might they clinically have presented? And some nice ciliated epithelium here. So if it was in the middle of their airway, do you think there's going to be much air going around here? We have this big ball of tumor right in their airway here. Dysmia, yeah. So it could be dysmia. Um, uh, could be strider. That's usually a bit more of upper airway. Yeah, obstructive pneumonia or atelectasis, so a collapse of the lung, right? If we're not going to get good aeration, we can actually get collapse of the lung. So these patients can have, uh, often present with a complete collapse of the lung. Okay, so let's move over to the other piece because I think it shows the morphology a little bit better. And so we let's I'll point out some of the features here. So we have this growth pattern of cells. They're kind of in this trabecular arrangement. Um, some there's these small nests and sheets, and you have this thin fibrovascular cores running through them. The cells themselves have a moderate amount of cytoplasm. Their nuclei are round to oval, and they have this characteristic chromatin pattern. And so we call this chromatin pattern salt and pepper. So the salt are these fine little um, um, dots in the chromatin or specks, and these larger um, spots are the pepper. So that's the salt and pepper chromatin. That you see. Um, and then we have this little guy right here, which is probably a, a mitotic figure, but um, that's actually right next to my handy dandy dot. Um, and I'll tell you, that's probably the only one you're going to find in this tumor. And then the other thing, there's some pertinent negatives we don't see in this tumor. We don't see any significant necrosis. We're not seeing prominent nucleoli, um, and the mitotic activity is quite low. Perfect. Okay, so that brings us to our first poll. So what do people think the best diagnosis for this case is? Is it A, carcinoid tumor, B, a typical carcinoid tumor, C, small cell carcinoma, or D, a poorly differentiated adenocarcinoma? Looks like we have the results are starting to come in. I'll show the results once we get a few more. So I think we have, oh, we have 24 people joining. So for those who've just joined, uh, if you want to respond to the poll, you can just follow this link up here at polleyev.com slash matchkini722. Um, and then you should be able to answer all these polls in real time um, and uh, um, contribute to the discussion. Uh, so maybe I'll show the results once we get to 10. So three more guys. Eight, nine, one more. You can do it. Okay, well, I'll stop at that. We'll go for nine. Next time, we'll shoot for 10. 
Perfect. So yeah, carcinoid tumor, that, that is the answer. Um, and so the next question here for this case is, which of the following is part of the criteria required to diagnose a carcinoid tumor? Is it A, a KI67 less than 2%? Is it B, a KI67 less than 10%? Is it C, mitotic figures less than 2 per 2 millimeters squared? Or is it D, a size less than 0 0.5 centimeters? Results are starting to come in. Seven, eight. Oh, we're down to seven. <laughs> okay, well, let's see what the results uh, say. Um, perfect, yeah, so you guys got it right. So the, the key to make diagnosis of a typical carcinoid is mitotic figures less than two per two millimeter squared. And so I put this question in because it's an important teaching point. So in contrast to neuroendocrine tumors in different systems like the GI system, in the current classification, we don't use KI67 in the classification of these tumors. It really just relates to the presence of mitotic figures and the cutoff for a typical versus an atypical is this two millimeters per two millimeters, so two mitotic figures per two millimeters squared. And um, this roughly corresponds to about 10 high power fields but because everyone's microscope has a different diameter field, recommendation is to use two millimeters squared um, instead of uh, the 10 high power fields. And there's conversion uh, and tables that you can use to uh, um, sort that out. <clears throat> and then a size less than 0 0.5 centimeters, if it was actually that small, you'd be classified as a carcinoid tumor lot. Um, so perfect. So that was a case of a, car a typical carcinoid. So just to review, you have the uh, solid grow, growth that's often central lesions. Um, they have a salt and pepper chromatin. They can have kind of a trabecular to solid growth patterns, and they have less than uh, um, two mitotic figures per two millimeters squared. They don't have necrosis. Um, yeah, and so let's look at a different case here. So we another have another resection of the lung here, and we have another large mass that we can see. So it's just it's loading up. But you can see from this low power, it's a quite blue mass. Um, and then so if we zoom into a little bit higher power, so maybe someone can write in the chat, what are these areas here? This real like pink areas where we're just kind of seeing the outlines of cells, but they've really lost their nuclei. You can see some outline of um, blood vessels. Yeah, infarction or necrosis. Yeah, exactly. So this is all tumor cell necrosis. Um, this is probably that this tumor is just growing so quickly. And so it's probably best characterized as uh, tumor cell necrosis and it's kind of outstripping its blood supply and so it's dying off. And so often the best place to look at the tumor from the morphology is if you kind of go to the edge of it. It's usually the best preserve. So I'm uh, just going to move around to get to the edge of the tumor here. Move in a little bit. So it's a bit of, let me just take a second to load here. So here we can see our tumor cells. Um, they have, in contrast to our previous case, they have a very high nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio. Um, they're really just nuclei with very little bit of cytoplasm. And then the other nice feature, I think, in this case is nuclear molding. So nuclear molding means that the nuclei of one cell and the adjacent cell, they actually kind of mold to one another because they're just essentially growing so quickly that they basically just indent into one another. And then the other thing I wanted you to notice is that in this single high power field, we have numerous mitotic, mitotic figures. So um, I'm in a single eye power, you know, I'm getting already above five mitotic figures in a single high power field. So we have florid mitotic activity, the presence of necrosis, these cells with high nucleocytoplasmic ratios, and they have prominent nuclear molding. And the other thing I want you to notice is about the chromatin, it still has this kind of fine stippled chromatin pattern, and we're really not seeing prominent nucleoli in these cases. Perfect. Um, so in this case, what would the best diagnosis be? Would it be A, a typical carcinoid, B, poorly differentiated adenocarcinoma, C, squamous cell carcinoma, or D, small cell carcinoma? Perfect. That nine was false already. And yeah, exactly, D. So yeah, so the, that is, this is a case of a small cell carcinoma. So next question, which of the following should you not see in a small cell carcinoma? Is it A, necrosis? Is it B, a mitotic index that's over 60 per two millimeters squared? 
Um, is it C prominent nuclei or is it D nuclear molding? Great, yeah, so exactly, good. This is an important teaching point is that um, in small cell lung carcinomas, we shouldn't see prominent nucleoli. And so if we remember back, we that fine stippled chromatin um, without really any prominent nucleoli. If you start to see prominent nucleoli, it's, it's probably not a small cell carcinoma. And so we do see necrosis in, in small cell and they can have an extremely high mitotic index, um, often over 60 per two millimeter squared. But by definition, they have to typically have more than 10, but usually it's much higher than this on this range of 60 per two millimeter squared. And then they do have this nuclear molding as part of their features as well. I think I have one more question about this case. So true or false, uh, TTF1 positive staining means that this small cell carcinoma is coming from the lung. What do you think, true or false? Perfect, good, yeah, so that, that's false. So um, any small cell carcinoma can actually express a TTF1. So if you have a, a TTF, a, a small cell carcinoma coming from the GYN tract or from the GI tract, um, they can all be um, positive for TTF1. So that uh, doesn't actually tell you it's coming from the lung. So this is a, an important pitfall um, that you should be aware of. So great job. So that's our next, that was our previous case with small cell lung carcinoma. So let's move on to our case here. So, there we go. So we have another lung resection. We have this quite large mass here. And so let's zoom down and see what's going on here. So we have these sheets and these infiltrating nests of tumor cells. And I think this case is a really nice um, example of this. So what are these little lines in between these tumor cells here? Can someone tell me in the chat what, uh, uh, what you would call these? These little tiny little spikes between these individual tumor cells. Yeah, intracellular bridges, great, good job. So, uh, and uh, what, what causes these intracellular bridges? What's the, what's the cellular um, component that's actually, desmosomes, good, yeah, or hemidesmosomes. Um, and so that's essentially like they're little rivets that are, uh, that are gluing these cells together. And these cells have this really prominent eosinophilic cytoplasm. They have much more cytoplasm compared to our small cell case. They're still mitotic and active. And in areas that have a bit of keratin formation as well. Um, and then we do have areas of necrosis as well. So let's see, so let's go to the poll. This case is not too challenging, but so what do you think? I wanted to have this case as the kind of a, uh, uh, I think it'll be a nice contrast to some cases that are coming up in, in shortly. But that's what people think. Exactly, so this is a small cell carcinoma, I'm sorry, squamous cell carcinoma. So the intercellular bridges and the keratinization are features of a squamous cell carcinoma. Um, and it would be good to diagnose it as that. So perfect, so let's contrast it with this case here. So we have another central lung mass. Um, you can see, because we have this cartilage here. Um, and the tumor is actually invading into the cartilage here. So you can see this tumor kind of eating its way into the cartilage there. Um, once again, we have some necrosis. Um, and then as we're going through it, uh, some of the cells do look vaguely squamoid where we have this more eosinophilic to clear cytoplasm as we move through. There's these more uh, solid areas of these squamoid cells. Um, and then as we move over here, we start to see more kind of cystically dilated spaces. We start to see some mucinous cells um, and some cells that are kind of um, in between kind of a third cell population. So we have this kind of mixture of squamoid cells with this cystically dilated spaces, with these uh, mucin cells with this abundant uh, apical mucin um, that's kind of more forming more of a central lung mass. Um, just as comparison, there's some normal structures here as well. Um, so we have, here's our normal minor salivary glands that you can see throughout the aerodigestive tract. So it's not just in your head and neck actually have salivary gland tissue um, into your lung as well. So let's see, what are people thinking that the best diagnosis of this case is, would you call it A, a squamous cell carcinoma? Would you call it B, a non-small cell lung carcinoma not otherwise specified? C, an adenal squamous carcinoma? Or D, a mucoepidermoid carcinoma?
Perfect. Okay. So yeah. So good job. So the the majority gets it again. So this is in fact a mucoepidermoid carcinoma. Talk a bit more about it in a second. So what fusion would you typically see in these mucoepidermoid carcinomas that you could use as a fish test to help make the diagnosis if you were uncertain? Is it A, PLAG1, HMGA2? Is it B, SS18, SSX? Is it C, VCOR, uh, CCN, B3? Or is it D, mammal 2 with CRTC1? A bit of a trickier question. Perfect, yeah, great job. So the majority gets it again. So the correct, the fusion that you typically see in mucoepidermoid carcinoma is this mammal two CRTC1 fusion. Um, PLAG1 HMGA2 is typically, you can see this in a subset of pleomorphic adenomas. Um, SS18, SSX, you see in synovial sarcomas. And B-core cyclone B3, you see in these um, um, Ewing's-like uh, B-core translocated tumors. So perfect, so that's a classic case of a mucoepidermoid carcinoma. So typically in these, these tumors, you actually see a three cell population. You have the squamoid cells, you have the mucinous cells, and you have an intramucous cell population. These are typically central lesions and they can occur as well in younger patients. Okay, so moving on to our uh, next lesion. We have some small biopsies here, and as you can see at low power, they have a really blue appearance to them. As we zoom down, you can see, once again, we have these cells that have this high nucleocytoplasmic ratio. But in contrast to our small cell case, we do have some prominent nucleoli in this case, so that should take us away from the diagnosis of a small cell. We're really not seeing great nuclear molding. Um, the other thing I want you to notice is that the, the degree of atypia is not extremely high. These cells look somewhat some monomorphic, where they look relatively similar to one another. Some of them have this kind of vague glandular formation, but in other areas, it's more of this sheet-like growth. Um, and I'm just going to zoom out for a second, move up here. But in other areas, they start to differentiate out a little bit, where we start to see a little bit more of this eosinophilic cytoplasm. Um, they are mitotically active, so we have a number of mitoses all throughout. Um, and uh, this looks like it's a, um, a very aggressive looking tumor, but it is a bit monotonous as well in its appearance. So um, what, uh, um, what, what do you think that you should include in your differential for this case? Um, so it could just be a basaloid squamous cell carcinoma, but what other important diagnosis should you um, think about? Is it A, a synovial sarcoma? Is it B, an epithelioid sarcoma? Is it C, an angiosarcoma? Or D, a gut carcinoma? Perfect. So this is a tricky one again. Um, so I think I might have fooled some people with a bit of the monotonous look to it that you're thinking of translocation sarcoma, which is a good thing to think of. Um, but this is, in fact, a case of a nut midline carcinoma. Um, and here's just the immunostochemical stain for um, nut, um, which works uh, pretty good. It's, it's pretty sensitive and specific to this tumor. Um, and so you can see here, you get this nice nuclear positivity that has this kind of speckled pattern all throughout these cells. And so these cells will have a fusion of uh, nut with uh, BRD4. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the mechanism in a second. Um, and so this is a bit of trivia for these, and it's an important diagnostic feature that can help you um, in these cases when you should think about a nut carcinoma. So what histologic feature is associated with a nut carcinoma? Is it extreme atypia? Is it abrupt keratinization? Is it glandular formation? Or is it D, mucin production? Perfect, yeah, good job guys. So the answer is uh, ab abrupt keratinization. Um, so I'll show you a picture of that um, coming up on the next slide here. So um, this is from a previous tutorial I did on this uh, tumor, where you see this kind of sea of blue tumors, then out of nowhere, it just abruptly differentiates into squamous cells, where you can see these keratin pearls, um, and, uh, um, and, and you see this abrupt squamous differentiation. So if you're looking at this really primitive looking tumor, it looks a little bit monotonous, and then out of nowhere, it just abruptly differentiates into this well-differentiated squamous. Um, you should really think about a nut carcinoma. 
and so this tumor actually has a very uh, um, interesting mechanism. I won't go too much into the details, um, but what happens is you get this fusion protein between BRD4 and NUT, and it actually will bind to acetylated histones. And then this complex will then recruit P300, which will then acetylate histones. And what happens is you get this feed forward loop where this complex between nuts and BRD4 actually layers down on the chromatin. And you get these big, large mega domain bases of this laying down. And then this turns on expression of genes that normally cause the, the tumor cells to differentiate. And then so the, what happens is, is you get the squamous cells reverting to this really primitive I'm looking to phenotype, phenotype because of these large mega base domains. And the interesting thing is that these tumors really are um, um, genetically quite simple. Really, they often only have this fusion between BRD4 and NUT. And that really causes these drastic changes because of the changes it induces to the genome landscape. And uh, there are some interesting data coming out that you can uh, treat these with some uh, targeted therapy. And so um, it's another reason why it's important to make these diagnoses. Perfect. Good job, everyone. Uh, so I think that we have a good um, mnemonic here is uh, birds, the animal for nuts. Uh, that, that's a good idea for BRD4 and nut. Um, thanks for sharing that. And so here's our uh, next case here. So at low power, we have a resection again here. And then we have these kind of complex glandular structures here. And we have all this necrosis here, which is the luminal necrosis. Um, does anyone know another term for luminal necrosis that we that uh, pathologists will often use to describe this uh, luminal necrosis that you can see in the um, adenocarcinoma? Um, and then the the tumor also has that dirty necrosis. Perfect. Yeah. So dirty necrosis is the characteristic term we often use for it. We have these columnar cells that are lining these complex glands. They have these kind of elongated uh, pencilate nuclei, um, and we see these all throughout. Um, and then I'll just show you something else here off to the side because you should always look at your whole slide. And we have these little things here, which we'll talk a little bit about in a bit. But okay, so first question: Where do you think this cancer came from? Do you think it came from the lung? A. Do you think it B came from the colon? Do you think it C came from the breast? Or do you think it B came from the pancreas? What do you guys think? Perfect. Good job, 100%. Uh, well, good job. <laughs> so we got, uh, yeah, so it came from the colon. So the features are these, these columnar cells with this dirty necrosis, um, so that you really get your eye out that this is probably came from uh, the colon, can uh, colon cancer. Um, so you, you all, of course, uh, look at the history of the stains, but uh, your suspicion should be high. So you're looking at the nodes of the case, and then they come out like this. Um, what do we think is going on? Waiting for to load up here. So your lymph nodes, you're hunting for tumor, you got our lymphocytes or capsule, but then we have these big pink areas here. So what are these structures here that we're seeing here all throughout these lymph nodes? Yeah, so these are granulomas. So are these necrotizing or non-necrotizing granulomas, do you think? Yeah, good. These are non-necrotizing granulomas. We have a nice multinucleated giant cell there. Um, and these are really tight, well-formed granulomas. These, these aren't the granulomas that you're going to miss. These are, you know, knock your socks off, um, um, pretty obvious granulomas. Um, so they have this nice, tight characteristic to them. Um, so um, I remember we saw some of those two in the lung as well. So what other diagnosis do you think this patient has in addition to just colon cancer? Is it A, tuberculosis? Is it B, histoplasmosis? C, sarcoid? Or do you think that they're vaping and got a vaping lung injury? Good job. So we have 100% of uh, sarcoidosis. Um, and so that is the diagnosis in this case. I'll just show you another case here of um, um, uh, sarcoidosis in the lung, which I think highlights some important teaching points. Um, So um, sarcoidosis has these tight, well-formed, non-necrotizing granulomas. They follow a lymphangitic distribution. And so that means you can often, you see them essentially where the lymphatics run. So they run underneath the pleural surface. So here is a subpleural um, ne non-necrotizing granuloma. It's quite tight, has these nice multinucleated giant cells. 
Um, and then the other place that the um, lymphatics run is with the bronchovascular bundles. So often associated with airways, you have these um, granulomas as well. And that's why the diagnostic yield when you're doing a transbronchial biopsy for sarcoidosis is actually quite high because when they're doing a transbronchial biopsy, they're essentially coming out of these small airways and sticking needles right through here. And that's essentially where the granulomas love to be. So there, there's a, a relatively high um, um, yield to that. And then it also tracks along the interlobular septum. Um, and then these granulomas are nice and tight and well-formed. They're often called naked granulomas because there's a relative paucity of lymphocytes associated with them. Um, yeah, so this is a classic case of sarcoidosis. Um, you know, sarcoidosis is, of course, a diagnosis exclusion, so you want to rule out other causes. If you start to see a mixture of necrotizing and non-necrotizing granulomas, that's usually an infectious process. Um, so um, you, you always want to do your bug stains for your fungi as well as for acid fast organisms. Um, and then uh, the, there's, you also have to really have exposures like barolinium exposure can look exactly like sarcoidosis. So in the right clinical context, this is diagnostic of sarcoidosis. Good job. Okay, so moving on to our next case here. We have another lung mass here that looks really well circumscribed on low power, almost like it would just pop out or shell out on the growth. And so then we zoom down to higher power. So what kind of uh, um, uh, tissue do we see here? Uh, tissue is this here? Yeah, cartilage, perfect. Um, and then what about this here? What do we have here? It's got all these holes in it. These kind of, it's all been washed out. Adipose, perfect, good. Um, and then we also have some more chondromyxoid areas here as well. Um, and then you can often get some entrapped um, epithelium that kind of gets brought into these tumors as well. It's not one there. Epithelium um, kind of got entrapped and brought in over here. So here's this kind of epithelium can get a bit metaplastic, look a little bit squamoid. Um, yeah, so that's our case. Let's see. What do you think the best diagnosis for this case is? Is it A, a teratoma? Is it B, a chondroma? Is it C, a hamartoma? Is it a D, a chondrosarcoma? You have to start getting harder questions. So yeah, everyone's got it right. So this is a um, hamartoma. Um, and so, because uh, um, we see multiple germ cell elements, so we see, but they're, they're tissues that are normally supposed to be there. So that's why it's not a teratoma. So we see cartilage, we see fat, we see that kind of chondromyxoid tumor. Um, if instead the patient actually had a chondroma, so it was just the cartilaginous tissue, and then they also had a gist, and they had a periganglioma, um, what syndrome do you think that they most likely have? Is it A, carny triad? And I'm being really tricky. I'm giving you another carny, um, um, uh, uh, the carny complex, which is different than carny triad. Is it C, uh, men one, or is it D, men two A? Definitely a challenging question. Oh, you guys are great. So yeah, so this is a uh, carny uh, triad. And so that's uh, typically, uh, you can see chondromas, gist as well as paraganglomas. And so that's why it's important to make the differentiation between a hamartoma and a chondroma, because if they have some of these other features, they could potentially have this syndrome. Great job. Okay, so moving on. So we have a next case here, another big, large lung mass. It looks very blue on low power, kind of diffuse sheets, and we get a kind of sense that there might be some necrosis there. So as we zoom down, we once again see this uh, uh, tumor cell necrosis where you just see these ghost outlines of the residual cells. I think as you can see here, they, they have a little bit of an interesting kind of appearance that you can kind of see in these partially necrotic cells where you have these nuclei, they're often off to the side and they have a bit of more eosinophilic cytoplasm with these kind of more eosinophilic looking inclusions, almost looks uh, look like a rhabdoid type appearance. Um, but of course we should look in the actual tumor as well. And we see a similar appearance in these lesional tumor cells. The other thing is that in, in contrast to most carcinomas, they're falling apart a little bit. These cells really aren't all that cohesive. Um, the, most carcinomas will stick together a little bit more than that. And they, you can see once again, this more kind of rhabdoidy looking um, appearance to them. And you know, lots of atypia here. This is kind of knock your socks off um, atypia that you can see in some of these cells um, looking quite atypical. Um, so definitely a high-grade tumor. This looks like it's a very bad tumor, um, but um, so, um, 
we did this additional stain here. And so you can see here in these lesional tumor cells, the stain is lost, um, but it's actually maintained in the surrounding lymphocytes. So we have loss of expression here. So what, what does everyone think? What is the best diagnosis? And what do you think the IHC was that I showed you on the previous slide that showed loss of expression? Is it A, an epithelioid sarcoma with loss of IN1? Is it B, a smart a 4 deficient tumor with loss of BRG1? Is it um, a, a mesothelioma with loss of FAP1? Or is it a carcinoma with that loss of momentum? Or I guess, uh, but everything stands for momentum, I guess. So really, probably not the answer. Perfect. Okay, so I tricked you guys in this one. So that's good. So um, so uh, epithelioid sarcomas do have loss by 91. This is actually a case of a smart K4 division tumor, and that stain I showed you was a BRG1. So these tumors typically have this uh, discohesive appearance, where the cells look like they're falling apart a bit. They have a bit of a rhabdoid appearance to them as well, um, and they'll lose expression of BRG1. And so it's a bit confusing because this has two names. So smart K4 is actually the gene name and BRG1 is actually the protein name. So really you can say either, so it's a SMARK-A4 or BRG1 the slash deficient tumor. There's a bit of a, co a controversy or debate in the literature about whether these all represent SMARK-A4 deficient thoracic sarcomas, um, but a number of groups have actually shown that um, a, a subset of carcinomas, including lung and colon, can also lose SMARK-A4. And there's a, a nice study that shows that these are probably smoking related tumors and, and are probably related to a, to a carcinoma. And so these unfortunately though, regardless of their characterization and tend to do quite poorly and are quite aggressive tumors. But the hope is that there'll be um, ways to targetly treat these tumors. Great, so good job. Here's our next case here. Um, so you can see at low power, you have this kind of unencapsulated mass, looks like it has more some cystically dilated spaces. Maybe some mucin here as well. Um, so it's it's kind of well circumscribed, but it's not really encapsulated. And you kind of see it's uh, moving out into these areas as well. And then we move a little bit closer. We see this big cystically dilated space. We have all this mucin here. Um, and then we have these cells that kind of have this kind of vague papillary architecture with these papillary projections into the cystic space filled with this mucin. Um, and then we go to a little bit higher power and we take a look at the cells here. We can see that there are these pseudostratified columnar cells. One of these cells have on their surface here that's kind of into the into the new cystic spaces. A little bit of a terminal bar there. And what a, what would you characterize these structures as? Cilia, good, yeah. So we have cilia as well um, in these tumors. And then there's some areas that has a bit of a, a mucinous uh, cells as well. So we have a mixture of this. These cells have this kind of papillary architecture. They seem to be largely ciliated, these cystically dilated spaces with interspersed mucinous cells. Another thing, they look relatively bland. There's a little bit of atypia, but they look somewhat monotonous as well. It's not encapsulated, but it seems somewhat well circumscribed. I mean, it's definitely a tricky, challenging one. So what would your, be your best diagnosis for this case be? Would it be a mucinous adenocarcinoma? Would it be B, a mucoepidermoid carcinoma? Would it be C, a papillary adenocarcinoma, or would it be D, a ciliated mucodondrolary papillary tumor? Okay. Oh, great. So yeah, so this is a challenging one. This is actually an entity called ciliated mucinodulite papillary tumors. So maybe we'll just go back to it. and We can uh, talk about some of the features. So these lesions tend to be um, relatively well circumscribed, but kind of unencapsulated lesions. They classically have this papillary architecture that's lined by these ciliated cells. So that's this kind of giveaway here um, that of this lesion is the diffuse uh, ciliated cells. Um, yeah, I, I do love as well that when the name accurately describes the tumor. Um, and then they have these mucinous cells as well. And the other name for these is bronchial adenoma. Um, there's a, a paper that kind of expands the spectrum of them because not all of them will have this kind of characteristic look. Um, so that expands it just beyond this. But this is a classic case of a ciliated mucinodular papillary tumor. These tumors can have driver mutations in BRAF or EGFR, but they do extremely well. So you can just essentially excise these with small excision and uh, in, the, in the cohort cases, 
um, they, um, they do extremely well. So these tumors are more recently recognized. They were first kind of noted in the Japanese literature, um, but they've been uh, more recently described in a number of series um, uh, throughout North America um, as these kind of quite low grade lesions um, that have an excellent prognosis. And so the kind of clues that you'll see on, on small biopsies is, is you'll have this ciliated um, mucosa. They often have this papillary architecture and interspersed mucinous cells. Because you have this mixture of mucinous cells in some areas that can look a little bit squamoid, a mucoepidermoid carcinoma often enters in your differential. Um, but this is where the mammal tooth fish can be quite helpful because you wouldn't expect to find a mammal tooth fish um, of your arrangement in these cases. Great job. Okay. Uh, that's, oh, and then the other thing that can be extremely helpful on these is a P40 immunostimulical stain. So this is just showing it here, where they will have this intact basal cell layer in these as well. Um, so do you render this on, on biopsy or do you hold tumor? Um, so these can be extremely challenging to diagnose on biopsy. Um, and because they can be low-grade uh, neoplasms and the, with driver mutations, these typically will come out. Um, so the, the, on biopsy, you can often raise this as a potential differential, especially if you see this kind of basal cell layer of P40. Um, but uh, it's, it's often a diagnosis that is made on resection, but um, it, can, it can be done on biopsy, but it's quite challenging. But that's a great question. Thanks. Okay, so our next case here, um, it has an interesting look to it on low power, where we have kind of multiple foci throughout the specimen here, and it seems to be centered around these arteries and bronchovascular spaces. So here's our tumor here. We have a whole bunch of areas of normal looking lung, and then we have these areas of abnormal lung. And we have a kind of a spindle cell lesion where we have these elongated spindle cells, and it looks to be quite vascular, vascular where we have all these poorly formed uh, small little luminal spaces and we're getting all of this extravasation of red blood cells. So all these red blood cells are leaking out, which is a sign that we have some poorly formed vascular spaces, and they're all leaking out surrounding this tissue. Um, the cells themselves look a little bit monotonous. There's these elongated oval to spindled cells, um, and they're really hugging these arteries and these bronchovascular spaces. It's kind of, you can get the sense that they're kind of spreading along these and, and throughout the lung. Uh, Perfect. So um, and maybe in the chat, someone could say, what type of uh, lesion would they be thinking of? Um, kind of, if you're going to put this into a broad category, um, what type of uh, lesion would you think this is? A carcinoma, a sarcoma, um, some kind of reactive proliferation, a lymphoma? Um, uh, what kind of category um, would people think we're thinking of this kind of spindle cells um, with this uh, prominent capillary proliferation with the extravasated red blood cells? Yeah, so I think the, putting in the sarcoma, angiosarcoma is a great differential. Are there any other vascular lesions that's, yeah, so Kaposi's is something great to think of. Um, yeah, so let's see, what do people think? Do you think it's uh, A, an epithelial to an angiosarcoma? Do you think it's B, a Kaposi sarcoma? Do you think it's C, an angiosarcoma? Or do you think it's D, a pulmonary Langerhans cell, histiocytosis? Perfect, yeah, so it is a Kaposi sarcoma. And so um, what would be the classical history that you would expect to see in these patients? What, what would you expect to see if you were doing a test and they asked you, they said the patient has a history of X. What, what do they, these patients typically have a history of? Yeah, great, so it's HIV or old age. Yes, it's classically HIV. It's one of the AIDS defining illnesses. Um, and what immunohistochemical stain could we do to prove this diagnosis, which I think is my next question. Same. Yeah, so what IHC stain would be positive in a Kaposi sarcoma? I think people answered it in the, in the poll. Yeah, so yeah, so it's, uh, you guys, everyone got it right. So it's uh, HHV8 will be positive in a Kaposi sarcoma. Perfect. So that's all the cases in this series. So I hope everyone enjoyed it and had fun. Um, and just as we end, um, and maybe just type into this poll one thing that you learned today. Um, and hopefully at least taught you one thing during this session. And uh, um, um, hopefully um, I'll be able to do another session this weekend. Uh, and thanks to you for everyone for joining uh, um, across the world. It's been really great and you've been a great audience. I really appreciate it.
going to mute it, but I'll uh, um, I'll leave this thing up for anyone who wants to type in one thing they want to. Oh, there we go. Perfect. Thanks, everyone.